Okay. So it is officially five minutes past nine. Um, the rest of the Deloitte team has agreed that we should start at five past nine. Um, we'll allow other clients to join the call, but I think in it's a good time to start. Is everyone in agreement? Great. So good morning, colleagues and clients. Thanks for joining us this morning as we share the Deloitte Namibia COVID-19 survey. This survey is a third of its kind, and it gives a comparative account of how Namibian organizations are responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you to all the respondents. I see Ritur has asked a question there. Landry, will you attend to that quickly? Thank you to all the respondents. Uh, we've received about 139 survey participants this year, and that's about 100% more than last year. So thank you to everyone that's made this particular report very successful. We have a jam-packed session planned this morning, and we hope the report and the webinar will be insightful. Accompanying me this morning is Rochelle Fryer, Valerie Hammond, Landry Lombard and Chandra Janssen. Rochelle and Valerie will be co-presenting and are part of the Deloitte Human Capital team, but we will be talking to you from our homes in Windhoek and Johannesburg respectively. Being virtual and always online is now one of the new ways we do things differently. Virtual is the new norm and it is here to stay. Yes, one of the greatest benefits of COVID-19 it is that it allows us to stay connected with colleagues and clients, but in a safe and different way. About 18 months ago, we would be hosting these events face-to-face, -face, requiring a lot more logistical arrangements like flight tickets and visas, etc. Now we can do it efficiently by a click of a link. There is a silver lining. We have an exciting agenda lined up. Today we will be we, today will be high impact and very punchy, I promise. Rochelle and I will be taking you through some key highlights of the report and Valerie, our special guest and future of work subject matter expert will share the Deloitte point of view on hybrid work and with a future of work lens. During the course of the webinar, we will share a poll. Please do participate. Now for some housekeeping guidelines. In order to make this webinar as seamless as possible, please make sure you are logged off and have closed all other live streaming platforms. Today, you are viewing the webinar on our dedicated Deloitte Zoom platform. If you are experiencing any buffering issues, please refresh your page. Alternatively, restart your device or Wi-Fi router and, look on and log on to the platform again. But most importantly, please ensure that you have closed all other communication tools, such as MS Teams, Skype, and other Zoom meetings. We will be recording this session. During the course of the morning, we are going to engage you on the most recent COVID-19 flash survey results, unpacking the impact of COVID-19 on the employee experience. Last year disrupted everything, and this year is equally as tough at a personal and a professional level. My takeaway is we need to change our approach. As, may, as with any form of turbulence, the world's response was to try and make sense of everything that's happening with the objective to mitigate risk and ultimately come out stronger. Today, we hope to provide a comparative account of how organizations, local organizations, are managing the pandemic while zooming in on the employee and employer relationship. As a result of the turbulent times we face, there has been a definite impact on the current work practices. Despite the unique nuances each of your organizations hold, our data suggests there are key similarities in the challenges we need to solve. One of the major discussion points is leadership stance on leveraging near-term strategies that supports the novelty that the world will return to normal or pre-COVID business as usual, are challenged by the need to find a middle ground for the demand for remote work and, and, flexible, um, and flexibility. We hope today sheds light and inspires you to think and imagine new approaches when addressing the very real opportunities and challenges COVID-19 creates for Namibian organizations. As Peter Drucker famously said, 
the greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence itself, but to act with yesterday's logic. What data logic, protocols, policies, and philosophies is your organization pushing in the attempt to navigate a very new world of work as we start prepping for the post-COVID workplace? Let's jump into the results. The demographic results, as indicated on the graph, shows a nice increase in industry variety this time around. In terms of industry representation, new industries joining the respondent pool in the survey is the broad healthcare industry, regulatory services, religious institutions, agriculture, as well as a real estate investment. This year, with the largest rep represented industry is the financial services with 35%, followed by other 17% and professional services 14%. Finally, we have a good mix of large and small employers based on their head, on, on headcount. What does it mean to return to normal or to pre-COVID working arrangements for you? And is this the right approach for your organization? 39% of Namibian organizations that participated this year are operating on the premise that they will return to normal. Is this possible? Based on our human capital global research, a survival mindset used disruption as a point in time crisis to be addressed with the expectation that the organization will revert back to business as usual once the crisis is over. Organizations with this mindset, or rather leaders with this mindset, aim to deal with the reality that the world imposes. It's about doing what's necessary to succeed today. In our study, we learned that organizations that were best prepared for the pandemic were already adopting a thrive mindset of using disruption as an opportunity to propel the organization forward, using technologies to transform how, where, and by whom work gets done. Is your organization capitalizing on the disruption that the pandemic brought about, or are you merely surviving? From some recent interactions with local clients, some have already returned to pre-COVID working arrangements. For example, a local wholesaler and retailer have made small changes to their work shifts during the lockdown and have recently formalized their work hour policy to curb infections. Despite that, nothing has really changed for them, while other organizations in the financial services specific has used the pandemic to leapfrog their digital transformation strategy and journey, planning for improved automation and possibly looking at workforce planning for the digital world. As you can see on the donut, most of the respondents, 39% are operating on the premise that they will return to normal. 34 believe there's an ideal opportunity to redefine, reimagine business models, people practices, and operations. Participants that responded with other said that their organization has already been redefining or reimagining its operating model prior to COVID-19. In my discussions with a client over the past two weeks, both wholesale and financial service industry clients have said that they organize it, that their clients spending behavior hasn't changed since the pandemic. And therefore a radical move to remote work or virtual working doesn't make sense for them. That's a good point. I quote, the Namibian market loves cash and therefore the need for bricks and mortar branches or retailers remains competitive. Yes, a number of local companies have successfully implemented flexible working arrangements and updated their policies, but it would be erroneous to apply a blanket of statement or an approach that all companies and industries in Namibia have made major shifts to a more digital or online way of, work, of operating. Clearly, many Namibian companies have seamlessly reverted to, to pre-COVID operations with some extra attention on safety and hygiene. But what strategic choices is needed to thrive in the unexpected future? Let's talk about business continuity. There is a greater responsibility to make cascading choices and ensure a coherent, pragmatic, and iterative approach to developing an impactful strategic plan 
that solves for the now, but maintains a long-term view on business sustainability. Nearly 50% of respondents updated old business continuity plans and 33% developed new plans. During the pandemic, leaders have been challenged with the need to protect their employees while maintaining essential operations and response activities. Organizations need to continually shift gears and embrace the VUCA, the volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world we live in. We believe business leaders have a window opportunity to re-architect their organizations by aligning their strategy and operating models to the new reality, to rethink their risk management, reimagine their real estate, and accelerate the digital transformation and future of work. Now, a quick look at per work and personal life. I personally believe in blending work and life, but since COVID-19 hit um, March 2020, I found it difficult to switch on and switch off because work and personal life all happens in the space that, I am, that I'm talking to you from today. But the majority of respondents indicated that their organization has implemented additional strategies to balance work and personal life during COVID-19. Unfortunately, there are industries like tourism, retail, and healthcare that have experienced greater challenge as a simple remote working arrangement could not be adopted. Interesting enough, some respondents elaborated that their employers adopted a more flexible approach with regards to where work gets done, and they introduced rotation schedules to minimize the exposure to the virus and ensure business continuity. As Deloitte, when the when, when the pandemic hit, we could quickly just put our laptops in our bags, rush home, and it was business as usual for us. The topic of productivity is a very sensitive one for most leaders and boils down to trust. Trust shows up when psychological boundaries exist. The graph shows that a combined 81% of organizations have zero to 30% of the employees working from home but who are unable to fulfill their duties from home. A combined 19% of respondents are saying that they have a bigger proportion of their workforce, nearly up to 50% needing to work from home, but who are not able to fulfill their duties from home. Therefore, the larger proportion of respondents reported minimal number of employees role or roles needing to work remotely and experiencing challenges in doing so. Do you have an idea of which roles in your organization can work from home? And are you, up and are you able to provide them that the infrastructure to do so? While this does present a mixed view, it suggests the need for a multimodal approach. Clearly, a one size fits all approach to work architecture is no longer relevant. If we accept that geographic location is a major barrier or impediment to productivity, we need to understand that some jobs need to be on site and others can work remotely. Will your organization consider this and allow for a different, a new way of working that is beneficial to the employer and to the employee? We spoke about infrastructure just now. Infrastructure support during the pandemic. I recall in 2020, March, a number of retailers were out of stock with laptops as many Namibian organizations had to update desktop users to in record time. So 97 respondents indicated that internet or data was provided by the employer. 43 respondents had to make provision for their own internet connection. I'm personally using my home Wi-Fi today. Respondents that responded with other, their organizations offered them the option to buy furniture at a discounted rate and special terms. Some had to use a combination of their own cell phone data and personal Wi-Fi because no company data was made available. Clearly, this points to one of the key advantages for flexible and remote working arrangements. Wi-Fi and other overheads like coffee, toilet paper, and other real estate expenses are clear, easy cost savings during a very challenging time. Working remotely, or hashtag WFH. According to our 2021 survey, efficiencies appear to have taken a dip. 14% of 
are working less efficiently and 30% are working somewhat less efficiently. On the contrary, some have respond, responded that efficiencies remain the same in both years. In 2021, collectively, 28% of the respondents reported that performance levels are leading towards efficient and more efficient. Outcomes-based performance management practices is a driving force for WFH. If your organization was already struggling with embedding a performance management culture before COVID, this has definitely been highlighted during these tough times. If your organization's culture was negative before COVID, the pandemic has definitely made it worse. There's a greater need for shifting leader and team disciplines and behaviors towards autonomous teaming. And this is how teams will be more efficient, productive and cohesive while adopting a multimodal work arrangement. At a global level, a fortune, the Fortune um, magazine stated in their research that 39% of CFOs expect to return to a fully in-person workforce post-COVID. However, only 25% of employees prefer that working arrangement and 33% prefer one to two days per week in the office and 37 prefer three to four days in the office. Have you done any research for your organization around preferences. The reality, working from home could be a great retention tactic. It could enhance your employee value proposition and it, could be, and it will become a market trend for top talent. Are you rethinking your talent strategies to win top talent or to reorganize your workforce planning to a more gig, econ gig talent economy, giving top, reg top regional or global talent access to your organization? Do you know what your, your people want? That's the big question. So now onto the topic of employee engagement. Employee engagement is defined as employees' level of attachment towards their job, co-workers and organization. Engaged employees have an emotional investment into the organization. They show passion for their work and establish deep connections with their co-workers and they go the extra mile to help the organization succeed. Nearly 50% of respondents indicated that, that employee engagement has negatively been impacted by, by the pandemic, compared to 21% that have experienced a positive impact. The key is to look beyond employee satisfaction and instead to motivate employees to do their best and remain fully committed. There's talk of a fourth wave, and only time will tell what the near-term future will look like for all of us. What is your organization's stance? Have you redesigned your people, processes, practices to enable the next level of productivity and engagement? Have you understood the implications on people policy contracting before making key shifts in how you aim to work going forward? During the pandemic, driving in employee engagement is very challenging. As a team leader myself, I find that keeping connected, making sure that we have a lot of check-ins is a way to sort of gauge where your team is at. Organizations are being tested on whether their company culture can survive and prosper in this new world of work. And leaders need to decipher how to maintain the best parts of their culture in a remote environment. As seen on the screen, employee engagement levels has been negatively impacted. Yet 22% 22, 22 say it's positively impacted. Have the ways of work been defined and embedded at your organization to support the shift in culture you want for the future? I also know it's been a very tough time for most Namibians, especially during the third wave. Um, we've lost a lot of um, colleagues and family members. A lot of people have been ill. But um, how do we ensure that engagement continues despite living in a very, very challenging time? Now I would like to hear from you. Please complete the Zoom pop-up answering the four questions, yes or no. Your response is anonymous.
Great, we have one participant. Okay, we have two, 20%. There you go. Thank you, everyone. So at the moment, it looks like there's a very strong yes in the first question. Very strong no. Okay, well, there's another yes, so that's shifted. Interesting. Okay. So there's actually no clear winner in, in any of the questions. Very interesting. I will share that soon. Okay, so we have 80% participation. We're just waiting for two more people. And then we're done with the poll. So at the moment, question one, do you think organizations will have to adopt new employee engagement initiatives? There is a 75% yes. Interestingly enough, question two is equally divided between yes and no. So do you think leaders in your organization are ready to embrace new hybrid work models? It's a 50-50 split. Same for question three. So is your organization considering applying a blanket or one size fits all approach when planning their return to workplace approach? As well for question four. Okay, so it's also a 50-50 on, do you think vaccination should be made mandatory by employers? That's an interesting statistic. So um, we're just waiting for two more people to participate. Okay, there's one, thank you. So just one more. And that shifted it a little bit. So that's interesting to see. Okay, so we're almost done. Thank you, everyone. I will share the results soon. Okay. So we're not getting that last vote, but let's see what the statistics say. Okay. So let me know, Priscilla, if you can't see them all, I'm not sure what it's looking like on your side. I can see them, thanks. I'm just reading through them quickly. Okay. okay, so there's an interesting shift there that happened with that last one. So it's definitely more of a yes in the first question. Definitely a new engagement initiatives. Oh, sorry. Do you think leaders in an organization are ready? There's more of a lean towards no, probably not. So question three and four. So three, is your organization considering applying a blanket approach? More of a lean towards no, as well with um, if employers should make vaccinations mandatory. Also more of a, a shift towards the no. But it's interesting to see that it's actually not that big of a shift. It's still 44% that people um, would agree with that they, the employers can make it mandatory. So that's very interesting to me. Yes. Okay, so that's that. Considering the media um, articles of yesterday where a number of Namibian leaders are considering doing a mandatory approach to vaccinations. So thanks to everyone for sharing your thoughts. I do agree that the back to work strategies um, to take more of a multimodal approach, but I must say in conversations with a number of clients in the recent weeks, some are taking a blanket approach. I know of a particular uh, CFO that made a, a statement that everyone will be back in the office on the 1st of October and it caused quite a quite a stir in the employee base um, and it just calls for another reason to start consulting start having those conversations um, at Deloitte particularly we've done our entire study around what are the preferences and I'm personally um, eager to see what the results of, of that, that survey was at, at an Africa level. But yeah, working from home, working remotely, it's a great concept. And I think when the pandemic hit, everyone sort of was in survival mode and we made this thing happen. But one thing that we can't be naive about is that there are barriers to working effectively remotely. And the main barriers reported by respondents is a distracting environment at home. And I think the disruption in the national ca school calendar 
um, forcing a lot of us parents to homeschool was one of the biggest distractions for, for me personally. And I'm super happy that the kids are back at school and at daycare. But it was really hard for me to concentrate and to get deep thinking done, um, especially when the kids were home. Another barrier is job type requires on-site presence at the workplace and in, in, inadequate technology infrastructure at home. So despite the fact of having Wi-Fi or fiber, et cetera, a lot of people find that the calls are dropping or um, documents aren't uploading. And this is all aspects of making it a bit more challenging when working remotely. As Deloitte, we've defined the key barriers to virtual work to include um, but not limited to productivity challenges, culture, and leadership. So it's quite interesting from the poll that a number of you said that uh, the leaders aren't ready to adopt um, a, a hybrid way of working or implementing that. Um, and that clearly speaks to a need for upskilling and um, creating that autonomous and trusting work environments that um, requires people to work from different locations. Overcoming these requires leaders to be bold and initiate um, the needed discussions while acknowledging these barriers and not, ignore, and not ignoring them. I think that's one thing that we are seeing is that a number of top leaders are just saying this will go away, these issues will go away once the pandemic stops. Um, considering the fact that there's a fourth wave coming through, uh, when will this stop? When will things really start stabilizing for us? Um, and shouldn't we shift gears to make sure that we can deal with it better? So hybrid and virtual work is a new normal and employees need for a level of certainty, despite this disruption, is quite important. Um, and this is just a, um, a call to all leaders on today that providing your teams and your, your staff a bit more certainty and allowing them to participate in the decision making will probably also help them during the, the, the current um, times that we, that we are living in. Other barriers to performing remotely or hindering performance in the Namibia um, organizations include training and upskilling is more difficult. So companies are finding it difficult to do training remotely. Internet speed and connections aren't trustworthy or efficient enough. We've spoken about that. And then sometimes employees mismanage their time or tend to be more relaxed when working from home which leads to poor work ethic. I think this is quite a nice topic to have a discussion about at some point. And then the lack of oversight is also seen as an obstacle by, me, by some companies. I think there's the culture still prevails in some of the living organizations. If I don't see you, you're not performing. Um, and that's going to take some, some change management and getting used to. One important question I want to leave with you on the topic of remote work is, has your organization reskilled your leaders and people to work effectively and sustainably in this new work reality? I think some companies are considering putting the plug on remote work, but have we necessarily given people the, the upskilling and, and the tools to be able to make a success of this? I know that it was a crisis and a lot of us were just trying to get by, but there is a really good opportunity around making uh, remote working the way of working going forward. We've seen some of our clients make rush decisions around compulsory on-site working directives, and it appears to be backfiring because employees have become accustomed to the flexibility and they prefer it. We have seen that when doing deep thinking tasks, for example, writing a report or doing analysis. But personally, me preparing for this particular webinar, being home is more advantageous than being in an open plan office at Deloitte and having everyone come and talk to me while I need to concentrate. Whereas we have seen that when you need to collaborate or allow for some kind of creative brainstorming, in person or face to face is way better. So it's really about not just looking at who works from home and who doesn't, but maybe taking, a taking some time to find out what type of tasks as a team should we do in the office and which ones can be done remotely. For 
most HR professionals, leave allocation was a major challenge during the third wave with the rise in positive cases. I'm part of a WhatsApp group with a whole lot of um, HR champions across the Namibian um, market. And I think this question came up a couple of times. Hi, guys, what are you guys doing around leave? How are you applying this? I've also seen a number of clients doing mini surveys around what leave allocations and quotas are you giving and updated, et cetera. But as you can see on the, on the infograph, only 12% of organizations in this survey said that they've implemented new or, or additional leave types for the purpose of bereavement or for when employees need to take care of family members. The rest, 88%, did not implement any new or additional leave arrangements. The COVID-19 pandemic has placed additional stress and pressure on, on everyone. Fear, anxiety, loss, and prolonged sickness related to COVID has proven to be overwhelming and work-related stress during the pandemic has led to burnout. Managing both physical and mental well-being is essential for employees. Productivity and overall engagement level. Interestingly, some respondents shared that if employees run out of sick leave at their organizations um, and annually, the company uses something called a leave bank where the other employees donated their leave from which leave can be allocated to the employees to avoid unpaid leave. Other organizations implemented five days of COVID leave, which expire if unused. Finally, some respondents selecting other indicators that they, that employees are required to book leave from the annual leave quota. Let's hear from my colleague Rochelle now, who will share insights on the effectiveness of leadership during these very tough times. Thanks, Rochelle. You're on mute, Rochelle. Thank you, Priscilla. Um, dynamics of navigating this new techno technological world. But thank you for handing over to me and thank you everyone who's joined this webinar this morning. It's great to have you all on this call. I'll be speaking to you a little bit about engagement and leadership support pertaining the COVID-19 pandemic. Nearly 50% of respondents agreed that leadership is showing the necessary empathy and support during the pandemic. Clearly the rules have changed, and resilient leadership is required during turbulent times. In fact, some would probably say it's essential. The 2021 Deloitte Human Capital Trends Report issued earlier this year elaborates that the important shift from survive to thrive depends on an organization becoming and continuing to stay distinctly human at its core. It's not just a different way of thinking and acting. It's a different way of being and one that approaches every single question, issue, and decision in business from a human angle first. What is a Thrive Mindset? It's a mindset that's really about perpetually cultivating things like resilience, courage, judgment, and flexibility to navigate turbulent times. And this resonates so well with what Daniel Pink said, that the future will be driven by creators and empathizers. COVID-19 has surely tested the limits of the employer and employee relationship. I'm sure that many of you will agree to have witnessed this. The pandemic has strained the relationship and employers have been called upon to support workers' health, their livelihoods and their dignity to unprecedented degrees. And their success or failure to do so has come under great scrutiny. On the one end of the spectrum, we see scenarios where employees showed remarkable resilience and adaptability as they rose to the pandemic's challenges. And with their employers' support and mandate, they achieved innovative results that could otherwise have taken years to materialize. However, despite this great example of a success story, on the other end of the spectrum, we also see evidence of less positive results. This can be seen in the February 2021 Harvard Business Review study, where 89% of workers said that their work life was getting worse, 85% said their well-being declined, and 56% said that their job demands had increased. 
this isn't a great picture. The ability to work effectively and productively requires new ways of working, and it requires the ability for us to leverage new technologies. It also requires leaders that are capable of leading autonomous teams with a range of working contracts and different working realities. And so success going into the future will be based on the ability of organizations to reskill their workforce. If we then stop, reflect and look forward, we see that the COVID-19 pandemic has had a major effect on all our lives. Again, something that most of us can agree to. Many employees are facing challenges that can be stressful, it's been overwhelming, and cause strong emotions in both adults and children. Public health actions, such as social distancing, are very necessary to reduce the spread of COVID-19, but they can also make us feel quite isolated and lonely, and this can increase stress and anxiety. So learning to cope with stress in a, stress in a healthy way will make you, the people you care about, and those around you just become so much more resilient. So what are some of the additional safety precautions deployed by our organizations in the last 18 months? From our survey, we see that Namavin employers have increased wellness approaches over the last 18 months, showing compassion and empathy to their workforce. Counseling services and vaccination campaigns are confirmed by respondents as the most common initiatives implemented over the last year and a half or more. Respondents that indicated other elaborated that candles for loss for the loss of loved ones, the provision of oximeters and oxygen concentrators, companies paying for COVID tests, the approval of special leave COVID, uh, special COVID-19 leave quotas were among of some of the initiatives implemented by the organizations. Other employers started wellness initiatives such as Soup Friday campaigns around the importance of COVID-19 and the vaccine, as well as herd immunity. They also started initiatives such as sharing updates regularly regarding colleagues both impacted and recovering from COVID-19. As indicated on this slide, what we see here is a collective 76% of respondents that agree that the leadership is really showing the needed support during the COVID-19 pandemic. We also see a minority group of 8% not experiencing that same level of support and 16% reporting a neutral view on this. We've seen COVID-19 bringing several complexities into play in the workplace and the dynamics around the employer-employee relationship has been no exception to this. And so the question now becomes, what leadership behaviors, skills, competencies will be required to navigate this relationship in the future world of work, which lies ahead, or that is in fact already here? Finally, a COVID-19 survey wouldn't be complete without a view on the topic of vaccinations, something that Priscilla touched on slightly earlier on already. As we can see on this slide, the majority of respondents are encouraging, are encouraging employees to vaccinate. And in re recent media articles, Namibian leaders are leaning towards making vaccinations mandatory. This does, however, open up a whole new discussion around employee well-being, human rights, and basic conditions of employment. So a lot of food for thought that's left for us there. And with that, it's all from my side. Back to you, Priscilla. Thanks, Rochelle. Indeed, a lot of food for thought around vaccines. I think that's, that's quite a topical um, dilemma right now, um, considering everything that's going on in the media. But now I want to talk about something that's also a bit uncomfortable, and that's workforce planning with a specific look at retrenchments. So when comparing uh, last year to, to, um, to this year, it is evident that organizations look to other options as shown in the graph as alternatives to retrenchments. 
In 2020, Namibian organizations were considering retrenchments um, more than in 2021. Comparing Namibia to global trends, 37% of, of global companies are actively planning redundancies with the, in the next year, and 47% are planning to restructure. Only 36% are planning to redesign job roles to better suit remote or hybrid working. So it could be a, a bit of relief for a lot of people that retrenchments isn't the key focus for 2021. But I, um, but I do think that the economy is strained and a lot of us are taking, um, are pulling hard this year. But let's see how, how the future unfolds. Now I'd like to talk about money, money, money. Namibian organizations are adopting very different approaches to annual increase and bonus allocations. Just yesterday, I had a, a client from the financial services asking me um, around what are people doing? Um, what's the right way to do it? Um, from awarding salary increases and bonus for 2020 and 21 to zero salary increases and no bonuses for both of the years. So there isn't a one size fits all um, for, for this topic as well. Some organizations are continuing their bonus discussions and increased discussions, while others are implementing strict cost-saving measures while weathering the, the COVID-19 storm. We have seen strict cost-cutting strategies applied across organizations, which has resulted in additional social economic pressures and challenges at an employee level who are already experiencing a very challenging time in, in light of the pandemic. It is worth mentioning some local manufacturers of essential and disinfectant products have experienced a significant increase in sales and performance due to the surge in demand for their products. I've, in, in a conversation last week, I've also learned that some local wholesalers have been in the fortunate position to open new retailers um, due to an increase in sales um, in the recent months. So some industries are, are struggling, some companies are taking a more strict approach to how to, to REM and bonuses, whereas others are, are in a very fortunate position. So as you can see on the screen, um, there are some, some quotes um, from some, some of our respondents. But one thing is for certain that on average, bonuses and remuneration has been effective in both 2020 and 2021. But reading these quotes quickly, what we see is that one respondent said, while the bonuses in 2021 will be impacted, we did receive a bonus in 2020, and there have been no retrenchments since the inception of the pandemic. Another respondent said, we are somewhere between 40 to 50% pay cuts at the moment. There are no talk of increases or bonuses. And then lastly, the organization depends entirely on government funding due to economic pressure and limited funding from the government in recent years. The organization has been allowed to implement, has not been allowed to implement any salary increments. So this is quite an interesting topic. That last respondent um, is obviously from our government or, or, or SOE representation. And we all know that they are the largest employers in Namibia. And the fact that they haven't received an increase just shares, um, sheds some light on, on how tough things really are at an individual level for, for the average Namibian. So let's have a look at flexible working arrangements during the, the pandemic. If anything, many Namibians associate the pandemic with a unique opportunity to work remotely. All employees, obviously depending on the type of, um, of job that you do, was afforded a flexible working choice early 2020. Traditionally, this was reserved for more senior roles, highly specialized talent, and individuals that wanted reduced hours. During the pandemic, 83% of Namibian organizations adopted a flexible working arrangement. I'm sure this wasn't as easy, and there were a lot of uh, kinks and things that needed to be sorted out. But looking at glo globally at a recent Bloomberg Wealth study, 
Experts have reported concerns that future hybrid work will not, will not provide the flexibility employees have become accustomed to. How do we manage that at, a, as a, at an engagement and a leadership level? While 63% of employees expected to implement hybrid work policies in 2021, fewer than half plan to expand flexible work schedules. What does a sustainable, flexible working arrangement look like for your organization? Um, at Deloitte, if I can just share a little bit, um, because we're in the consulting space and a lot of our work can be done um, on a computer, working remotely, I think going hybrid was, is, is, very, is a natural approach. But I must say there are some leaders and some individuals that still prefer to see employees and to know that they're, that they're working. But one thing that's, that's playing in, in our advantage is that we've got a very strong outcome-based work and um, performance culture. So if you don't perform, you see it quickly. And this has really helped us to remain efficient and productive despite having a, a multimodal working um, environment. So formalizing the flexible working arrangement is another topic that a lot of Namibians are, are playing with or toiling with. Um, should we formalize this? Shouldn't we formalize this? Why should we have flexible working arrangements? So nearly 50% of Namibian respondents confirmed that an informal, informal flexible working arrangement was implemented during the pandemic, some of which have done so with supporting policy updates and some without. Some organizations have implemented a rotation schedule and asked employees, mostly admin staff, to work from home to lessen the risk of exposure to the COVID-19 virus. This also includes ship repair companies who have asked their shore-based employees to work from home. Has your organization piloted a proposed shift in ways of working before agreeing on a shift in people policy? If we think our staff can't deal with a pilot, remember the resilience and the focus we maintained when the pandemic hit us in March 2020. You don't know what you don't know. And I think we have this great opportunity as HR professionals and leaders to continue to experiment and to trailblaze something that works for your organization. If anything, our poll earlier this morning agreed that a blanket approach is not the answer. So how do we start moving towards a space where we can craft something that is bespoke for your organization? So working arrangements and the return to work strategies. What is your return to work strategy? And what is your organization planning around that? Instead of a one size fits all, we need to trade off what will work and what won't work. But let's look at some of the benefits the respondents shared when weighing up their return to work considerations using the Deloitte Future of Work dimensions, work, workforce, and workplace. I'm going to read just um, the highlighted boxes of what our respondents said in the survey. So some of the benefits of working from home or remotely is virtual meetings work well and save time and cost. Realize that being seated in an office does not equal productivity. Conditions of employment are being revised. Remuneration issues as well as bonus payments will, will also be addressed. The size of the workforce and the budget, especially human resources budget versus cost containment measures are being investigated. And then enabling employees to choose how and when to work, working from home is possible. And that technology can help us tremendously in having flexible working hours. More flexible working hours to reduce carbon footprint on our environment from an organizational perspective. So I think Often when Namibians look at, at working from home and remotely, often um, employers will say that it only benefits the employee. But as you can see with some of the, the quotes from our respondents, there's a host of advantages in terms of pursuing a back to work strategy that, 
that is flexible or multimodal. So preferences, people always want choice. If you've got a lot of Gen Xs and a lot of millennials in your organization, they want choice. They want to be able to feel like they are co-creating and influencing the decision. Majority of respondents in both 2020 and 21 survey want the flexibility to choose where they want to work from. What is your organization's stance on this? The premise of virtual working and the demand for a flexible working environment was gaining momentum long before COVID-19. The future of work is here, and I'm personally working with Namibian organizers, organizations, assisting them to find their hybrid workplace models as they, expo as they explore the art of the possible. I believe the places and the ways we work during the pandemic will relax and become part of a broader ecosystem that challenges pre-COVID ways of working. But now I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Valerie Hammond, who will take us through the final part of today's webinar. Thanks, Valerie, for sharing the Deloitte point of view. Thank you so much, Priscilla. Um, and I think, you know, what Deloitte has really learned through this process um, is that obviously the pandemic has completely, literally overnight shifted uh, organizations fundamentally in terms of how we think about work, the workforce, and the workplace. And this ideally positions organizations now to not only survive in a hybrid world, and not only to adopt previous ways of working and kind of try to squash them into a hybrid way of working, but really to start considering, um, you know, the fact that we are likely to work in a hybrid way for quite a long time going forward. And how do we leverage this as an opportunity for the organization and not just a compromise for the organization? So really moving from survive into thrive. Um, and what we've learned and the, um, the clients that we're assisting with at the moment in terms of helping them to shape their return to work approach is that there are five key considerations that organizations have the opportunity to really leverage to uh, make working in a hybrid context um, an opportunity for the businesses to thrive. So we look at the, the strategy and the operating model and, um, and really look at defining the guardrails that the organization should put in place in alignment with their strategy and their op, uh, op model um, to ensure that hybrid working uh, is optimized and to ensure that productivity is optimized. It really works for the organization uh, in its particular context. So we consider strategy and operating model. Very importantly is the consideration of people practices. And I think one of the lovely opportunities that, um, that remote working has brought us is the opportunity to engage different talent um, one, of our, one of our clients was talking about potentially using board members um, from across the globe and not just from, you know, from Namibia. Um, and then what are the implications of that? What are the tax issues around that? Um, and also, you know, another, another great opportunity for organizations is to use hybrid um, as an appealing employee value proposition. So how do you use the opportunity for people to work in a hybrid and remote way um, as an opportunity to attract top talent? Because people find that very appealing. But then also there's an opportunity to customize some of the people practices to ensure that people are as productive as they possibly can be in a hybrid context. And if we look at the right-hand side of the graphic, um, another key consideration is around risk, regulatory, and compliance issues. So I mentioned tax, for example. You know, if, um, if you have employed somebody who's not resident in Namibia, what are the tax implications for their employment status? 
What are the issues around localization and skills transfer? So all of those issues, and, and also how do you mitigate and manage risk when you're broadening your talent pool or allowing employees to work from home? Um, you know, what are some of the um, issues around safety and security of data and information? So all of that needs to, needs to be considered. And another big one is a consideration around real estate. What do we do with our offices now? How do we make them, how do we make those spaces work for us? How do we use those spaces? And finally, um, very obviously, is the technology consideration. So absolutely making sure we have the right technology in place to drive productivity um, and customer service. So, you know, not to, um, not to only focus on driving internal productivity, but also absolutely ensuring that our technology are, uh, ensures that we are accessible, we delight our customers, um, and that they feel as able to do business with us, in fact, more able to do business with us than they potentially did um, in a non-hybrid uh, kind of real world context. I'm just very mindful of time, so I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to hand back to, to Priscilla. Thanks, Valerie. Thanks for the insight around how we as Deloitte um, tackle the, the back to work strategy approach. Um, colleagues, we've come to the end of our, of our webinar um, and we want to Thank you all for joining. I hope that today has been insightful and that it's inspired you to think differently without using yesterday's logic um, and really looking into what it, the art of the possible um, when navigating the, these turbulent times. Um, please feel free to post any questions in the chat box. Um, and as the panel, we will be more than willing to, um, to answer them. Also, you can contact Deloitte um, if you'd like a copy of the report, or if you want to take any of today's findings further, have a coffee or discuss it in, in more detail. So looking forward to hearing from all of you. We'll give you guys a, an opportunity to, to post some questions now.